Welcome also from my side. Um, my name is Olivero Angeli. As Professor Follender said, I'm uh, the scientific coordinator of uh, MEDEM. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce and share this meeting on immigration in Europe. It is based on a, a report which is, has been published in German and it's now available in English. You can download the report from our website and you will also find the link in the Zoom chat. Today we have planned three short presentations covering European regions analyzed in our report. Central and Eastern Europe on the one hand and Southern Europe on the other hand. These are regions that are or have been affected by immigration in the last decades. Additionally, we have a, taken a closer look at Germany and ask whether out migration, not only immigration, has an impact on voting behaviors. Um, is um, particularly benefiting the radical right parties in Germany, uh, that is the, the IFD. Today we will have three speakers, which I will briefly introduce in the order in which they will speak. First, we will hear from Marta Kozlowska, who is a research fellow out here at MIDEM, with a focus on Europe, Populism and Social Conflict Lines, and she is the author of the chapter on Poland in the report. We will then hear from Mariana Mendes, who is a postdoctoral fellow at MIDEM, focusing particularly on the rise of radical right parties in Southern Europe. She wrote two chapters in the report, in the, in the report on Spain and Portugal. Then following, we will hear from Mike Herold, who recently completed his PhD at the TU Dresden. He is the co-author of a chapter of the report on the relation between uh, immigration and voting behavior, focusing particularly on Germany. Speakers will have around five to seven minutes for their presentation so that we have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Just as a housekeeping notice, participants can type their questions in the chat box on the right side of the Zoom screen or ask a question loudly by using uh, the Zoom rise hand. I'm now happy to hand over to Marta for her presentation on Central and Eastern Europe. Marta. Thank you, Oliviero. Um, it is my pleasure today to present our results for Central and Eastern Europe. We chose Romania and Bulgaria as representatives uh, for Eastern Europe and Poland, Hungary and Czechia as examples of Central Europe. Despite the fact that the graphics that you, you see now on, um, on the slide appear at the first line to be quite different and that the data were not always um, satisfactory, um, we are nonetheless able to determine a, region, a regional typology of the um, structure and development of immigration. Um, here are the patterns that, were, that we were able to specify. The first big pattern is the huge role of European integration as a facilitator of the immigration from the region. Uh, the year of the EU accession is however, uh, which is 2004, 2007 respectively, were not so decisive as the immigration towards Western Europe started already in the 90s. The second, feature is the fact that it is predominantly the nationals, which means one's country own citizens who are emigrating. If you look at the graphs, um, the blue curve in each case represent the total emigration and the green one um, is the emigration of the country's citizens. We can see that with the exception, exception, exception of Czech Republic and in recent years Hungary, um, emigration is mostly driven by the people turning their backs on their home country not by foreigners moving away. For years, um, can I have this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, for years, the highest rates of emigration as percentage of the total population has been recorded, recorded in Romania, shown by the red curve uh, in the upper graphic. If you look, for example, at the 2008 data point, you see that around 1.5% of total population left the country that year alone. 
And in, in international comparison, this is a very high number. On the other hand, Bulgaria's population has declined the most due to the emigration. You can see it in the graph below on the green curve. In 1989, the country had around 9 million inhabitants. Today, it is under 7 million. It is also projected that in the next 30 years, the population of Bulgaria will decline by a further 2 million. Another important finding for the exam in Central and Eastern European countries, it is that it is not only highly skilled people who emigrate. There is also a significant emigration low skilled workers. These people um, typically work in the construction sector and agriculture and in another mostly Western EU uh, member state, but they are generally absent both from the media and the political discourse, despite the departure having a significant um, impact on the home country economy. Furthermore, we found that the emigration not only exacerbates demographic change, but also aggravates many problems in other policy areas. One such an example is education sector. Many researchers from Central and Eastern Europe see better opportunities in the West, and so they leave a gap in their home countries, an issue visible, for example, among uh, the staff of Medium. Another and even more dramatic case is the healthcare sector. In all of the countries we examined, the emigration of medical professionals causes serious shortages in healthcare provisions. In Romania, already around 10% of the population do not have adequate access to specialized treatment. The last notable result of our study is that labor immigration can mitigate the effects, the negative effects of emigration. We see that clearly in the Czech case in particular. Czechia has been an immigration country already since the early 1990s. And although today almost a million Czech lives abroad, um, the shortages on the labor market uh, are compensated by young people, mostly from Ukraine and Slovakia, who get attracted by the country's economic strength. Apart from the development and structure of immigration, we were also interested in the way emigration is processed by the public. That means the discourse around emigration. Starting with the public opinion, we determined, based on the existing opinion polls, that people in all analyzed countries perceive both immigration and emigration as a political issue. However, as one of the studies showed, the weight of the two phenomena differ. While in the Czech Republic, immigration is perceived as a bigger problem than emigration, in Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, and Hungary, emigration is perceived as a problem that is significantly more problematic. Furthermore, we analyzed the uh, parliamentary discourses, and this showed that the issue is hardly polarizing. The references to immigration are rare and far in between, and if they happen, they tend to be negative, for example, when brain drain is brought up. We found a positive perspective only in two cases. First, when it is spoken about the diaspora, and second, when the freedom of movement within the EU is um, invoked. We also determined that in most of the countries, the right-wing populist parties neither instrumentalize the issue of emigration nor are benefiting politically by addressing it. The only exception is Poland, but even then, the instrumentalization is rather small. The immigration is and will likely continue to be the long running issue of right wing parties. Finally, a glance at the media discourse reveals that immigration is treated very, very selectively there. The media focus primarily on the highly skilled immigration and the brain drain. The immigration of low skilled immigrants um, and the immigration of people from the third countries are clearly underrepresented by the media coverage. And with that, I conclude the part on Central and Eastern Europe. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I will be speaking about Southern Europe today. So doing a bit what Marta did, but apply to Southern Europe. So I'll start by looking at immigration patterns and uh, looking in specific at the total number of immigrants per year, meaning permanent immigrants, those who live for more than a year, which is the blue line in the graphs. Uh, there are a few clear general patterns. So the first one is a dramatic increase following the recent financial crisis. Uh, immigration numbers are roughly five times higher for Portugal and Spain 
and three times higher for Italy and Greece compared to the pre-2008 crisis period. A second pattern is that despite the subsequent period of economic recovery in Southern Europe, the fact is that immigration levels continue to be higher today than they were in the period before the crisis. A third um, trend is that with the exception of Portugal here, um, in the other three countries, foreigners, meaning former immigrants to these countries, actually constitute a very significant share of those who live. So the green line that you see in the graphs is the number of natives of the country who live, which as you see is significantly below the blue line, which is the total number of immigrants. And this difference is especially accentuated in the case of Spain, where more than 80% of those who left in the last 10 years um, are foreigners, um, non-Spanish citizens. And this is perhaps the biggest, or one of the biggest differences between Southern Europe and Central and Eastern Europe. Now, when adjusting um, immigration numbers to population levels, it becomes clear that the largest outflows were registered in Greece and in Spain. For instance, the peak in 2013 that you see um, on the first graph means that in that year alone, the equivalent, the equivalent of 1% of the total population of Spain and Greece left the country. Um, however, when you look at the natives only, which is graph number two, um, Spain is no longer a dramatic case, and instead it's Portugal who appears as the country with the second largest outflow in proportion to its population. Uh, finally, a word to say that immigration had a negative impact on population growth. Um, this is more accentuated in Greece and in Portugal, since both countries registered the steady population decline since 2010. They have lost around three 300,000 um, people each. Um, in Spain and Italy, there's no such decline in part because these two countries have higher immigration levels. So there was rather um, stagnation in population growth. Now, moving on to the second part of the presentation, um, immigration in the political discourse, there are also um, a few general patterns that I can highlight here, and many of them are actually similar um, to Central and Eastern Europe. So the first one is that while immigrant communities that are established abroad, the so-called diaspora, are very much seen in a positive light in the political and public discourse, for instance, as promoters of the country's culture abroad or as a source of remittances. Um, immigration, on the other hand, understood as the current exiting of people, is predominantly seen in a negative light, meaning as something problematic that should be addressed. And indeed, several countries have implemented um, measures or policies targeted at encouraging return. Um, a second trend is that um, similar to Central and Eastern Europe, there is little to, to no political conflict when it comes to the political treatment of immigration. Conflict arises more from government opposition dynamics than from fundamental differences in positions in the sense that uh, the opposition is generally quite keen on pointing fingers at the governments uh, for, um, for what they perceive as uh, excessive flows and they blame the government for that, while governments tend to remain more neutral or um, in a few instances even highlight the positive aspects of immigration, particularly in periods of crisis. Um, indeed, everywhere immigration is um, perceived mostly as a socioeconomic issue with socioeconomic causes and with a variety of mostly negative consequences. 
Um, nonetheless, it's possible to spot some differences in framing by different parties, and these differences are generally in line with the different ideological outlooks of the party. So just to give an example, the Five Star Movement in Italy uh, links emigration with its anti-corruption agenda, sees it as a result of a lack of meritocracy in Italy, while to give another example, the Greek radical right sees it as a form of exploitation by the richest countries in Europe who benefit from um, human resources educated in Greece with Greek taxpayers' money. Another general trend um, is the highly selective view of immigrants. Uh, first of all, non-natives are rarely acknowledged. And second, um, as in the Central and Eastern Europe, attention is overwhelmingly focused on the high-skilled high -skilled young immigrants. Um, in fact, uh, the composition of the immigrant population is quite diverse, um, but media and political discourse are more um, centered on the so-called brain drain. Uh, finally, my last point, um, some of us have also tried to investigate the relationship uh, in discourse between immigration and emigration. And it seems that almost everywhere these are treated as uh, separate topics. The occasional exception goes for some radical right parties, for example, in Italy where um, sometimes the outflows of natives are put against the welcoming of non-natives in a sort of competitive manner, or even invoking conspiracy theories of replacements. But this does not seem to be a dominant or a widespread strategy. Well, as Marta and Mariana have pointed out, um, emigration is a significant phen phenomenon in many European countries involving major effects in sociodemographic, economic, as well as in political terms. Besides the analysis of discourses and dynamics of politicization, we have also looked at the consequences of emigration for the political culture by using quantitative statistics, especially when it comes to voting and electoral outcomes. So what influence do dynamics of emigration have to electoral behavior? Is there, a, in particular, a significant correlation between emigration and the success of right-wing populist parties? To answer this question, we collected data from national statistical offices and merged them into a data set that includes information on emigration rates at the district level, which means for about 35,000 European counties, for 15 EU member states involving the period from 2009 to 2018. The results of the analysis firstly show that right-wing populist parties across Europe do not benefit from higher immigration rates in general, that immigration does not generally involve advantages or benefits for right-wing extremists and right-wing populist parties. On the contrary, what we have found out is that where more people emigrate, the vote shares of radical right parties tend to decline, so that these parties actually perform tend to perform worse on average across Europe. As it can be seen in this graph, the more you go to the right, which indicates a higher rate of emigration between 2009 and 2018, the lower the linear projection of the electoral turnout of right-wing populist parties is or becomes. However, this general correlation is strongly dependent from socioeconomic fact factors. In economically weak regions, the picture is a different one. As economic strength declines, the correlation firstly is mitigated and eventually even reversed until finally in economically weak regions, the blue line here in the graph, there is a different situation. Here, high immigration rates are accompanied by a growing share of votes for right-wing populist parties. To sum up, immigration across Europe has different effects in economically strong regions and in economically weak regions. However, everywhere in Europe, 
Structurally weak regions are often affected not only by immigrations to destinations abroad, but also by immigrations by immigration to economically stronger regions within the same country, for instance, to big cities or to economic centers. Hence, a further question is here how these dynamics of out migration in general contribute to the strengthening of right wing populist parties. We examined this question as well by referring to the case of Germany using aggregate data from the German Federal Statistical Office, as well as regional population registration offices, and of course, electoral data at the district level for the 2019 European elections and the 2017 Bundestag election. So what direct correlation can be determined between the out-migration rate and the vote share of the AFD in Germany? Already the graphical comparison here suggests certain coincidences because as you can see in the picture, regions that are portrayed in a very light color in the left picture, which shows the migration balance, the lighter the color, the bigger is the surplus of the outflow in proportion to the influx of people. These regions often have a very dark tone at the, at the right picture, which points to strong AFD results. To sum up, a correlation between outmigration and white ring populist voting behavior can be identified at the district, district level in Germany, which means that where many people have left over the past three decades, the tendency to vote for the AFD is significantly stronger today. This correlation is not influenced by socioeconomic or sociodemographic conditions in general, and it is strong in all parts of the country, in Eastern as in Western parts. When we look at Eastern Germany in particular here, however, as a region which has been greatly affected by the transformation after 1989, the relationship between migration, migration balance and AFD vote can be specified even more precisely in temporal terms. For if we investigate different time periods since 1991 separately, we find that out migration is not equally responsible for today's AFD affinity. That not every wave of out migration has had the same effect here. As you see in the graph, the lines marking the relationship between the surplus of out migration and the linear projection of the AFD vote, these lines actually change their direction they turn around when later time periods, the blue and the green lines, are depicted, which means that in such regions hit by the transformation after 1989, different waves of outmigration seem to have had different effects on the political culture in the respective regions of Eastern Germany. In the example of Eastern Germany, this indicates that it was not so much the outflow of people in the 1990s, but rather the wave of outmigration after the turn of the millennium, which has sustainably strengthened the tendency to, there to vote for a white wing populist party. And with that conclusion, I give the floor back to Oliviero. Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to thank uh, our three speakers um, and open uh, up discussion. But before I do this, I want to remind our participants today that the report on which our meeting today is based was uh, written not only by our three speakers, but also by other members of the MEDEM uh, team including uh, Giovanni De Canto Scube and Christina Schneider, who are participating to our discussion today and who wrote the chapters on Italy and the Czech Republic, but also to researchers um, um, who work at other universities. And I want uh, to mention particularly Julia Rona, uh, who is participating to the debate today, who wrote the chapters on Bulgaria, and Anna Kiviasi, who wrote the chapters on Hungary and Greece. Uh, so if you have particularly questions to these countries, you can um, address the question also to Anna and Julia, who are also welcome to add comments if they wish. But now, um, as I said, um, we can open up discussion and you can, you are welcome to ask questions by uh, switching on your 
a video and uh, and asking your questions. Maybe I have a question. Um, do you hear me? Yes. 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 Great. yes please. Uh, I have a question to Mike. I found uh, his presentation extremely interesting. And I think this is basically a research agenda there uh, to, to trace the connection between um, voting for populist parties and emigration. Um, what I wanted to uh, pose as a question would be, could there be other confounding factors uh, in terms of uh, voting for far-right populist parties? And I'm thinking here of the case of Bulgaria, which is, of course, very different from Eastern Germany, so it might, I might be totally off track. But um, I guess my argument would be that in Bulgaria in the 90s, there was no supply of um, far-right populist parties. So these types of parties appeared only after 2000, let's say four or five, while most of the remaining parties, like most of the parties basically that, that we had in the 90s were either like the descendant of the former communist party or a right-wing liberal party. So there was just no party to vote for. Uh, and I wonder whether this was similar in Eastern Germany and what was the party system dynamics there? Um, and secondly, and again, I think these are questions for future research basically. It would be interesting to see also the profile of emigrants, I guess, um, because, for example, in Bulgaria, the, and I think this was wonderfully demonstrated by the presentations also by Marta and by Mariana, and it's very similar to what they presented, because we tend to, like Bulgarians, tend to think of emigration as the emigration of highly skilled um, professionals that are often liberal rights in, in the C context. Uh, but actually, what the last elections have shown is that actually we have a cross-sectional migration. So we have also a lot of far-right supporters emigrating. So these are just two points that I think might be uh, interesting to pursue later. And again, they're based on the Bulgarian context and might be totally irrelevant in the German one. So I apologize if this is the case, but thank you. I found that the presentation extremely interesting. Um, and thank you also to the other presenters. I had missed the part on Southern. Um, Mike, you're welcome to answer the question, but before you do this, uh, I want just to remind you that if you have a question, please raise your hands or leave a notice on, in the chat so that I, I see that you have a question. Please, Mike. Well, thank you for the, for the question. Um, in, uh, well, Eastern Germany is, is, has been a kind of example for a transfer. I, I pointed it out as being a kind of example for a transformation region, because between 1989 and 1991, there were alone 1 million East Germans leaving their country for West Germany. And from the beginning or from the start, there have been actually there was a supply of right wing extremist parties there. There were the Republicans, the NPD, the DVU, and so on. There were many, many other small uh, right-wing extremist party. But uh, during the 90s, uh, big parties in Germany, uh, also in the lender, in the East German lender, successfully integrated huge parts of the electorate. The, 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 the right-wing populist party didn't get many votes. Um, but nevertheless, in these times, there was the collapse of the old economic structure, massive, massive loss of jobs, uh, many people left, uh, um, and where the, those who stayed were affected permanently affected by unemployment and so on. And then the the the, the, out, the first wave of out migration came to an end, and after the uh, millennium, uh, a new wave of out migration started. This time, this these were different kind of people. They were especially young people with uh, high educational qualifications, including women in particular. Uh, you can say these were the first cohorts to have an all German uh, educational biography and. Uh, were searching for the best uh, career op opportunities for their development. And they found them, especially in the old federal public in the West German states. And for many Eastern German regions, as we could also show in the, in the data, this wave of out-migration was uh, decisive because uh, it was not only a loss, this, is, this would be the explanation, it was not only a loss of innovative strengths and uh, dynamics, but also future opportunities. And since many, especially young women left, it was also a further decline for the birth rates there. And as you can see in these times after the millennium in the mid of the 2000s, 
then these right-wing extremist parties uh, uh, slowly were getting more and more votes until then the AFD came along along uh, not so many years ago and now it, it's the AFD uh, has about 20 25 percent of share of the votes in uh, what was the last election Saxon Anhalt and Saxony as well and so on so there was a supply from the beginning and I would also uh, point to the different waves of these uh, out migration with different uh, social uh, with different groups of people who were moving there Thank you, Mike. Um, I will start to collect question. And uh, so the next ones in my list are Christoph Roos and uh, Magda Ulcelese. I hope uh, I'm spelling your name correctly. So please, Christoph. Yes, thank you very much um, for inviting me to this talk here um, and your presentation. I really enjoyed the report as far as I could have, uh, I could have had a look uh, so far. So I'm, I got funding for a project that is quite similar to yours. I'm, I will be looking at um, responses to emigration at the national and EU level uh, in, uh, in Romania, um, uh, Portugal and Lithuania. So this is really, really, really nice that you just came out with your research here. Um, I will be st starting in, in September, it'll be an, a DFG project. And my question is, um, whether you only looked at responses uh, from political parties or like the society in general, like whether you also um, uh, researched how like civil society organizations, unions and employers view the issue of emigration. And a second and related question is, what types of policy responses were you able to identify? Um, so less the political discourse, more like the actual policy response. Thank you very much. Magda. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for um, the report. It's, uh, it's fascinating, and uh, particularly the, uh, the part about the relationship between immigration and um, the rise of right-wing populist parties. I don't have a question per se. I just wanted to uh, kind of piggyback on what uh, Julia uh, said earlier, and uh, then Marta also revealed with her findings, and the fact that um, as in Bulgaria and Romania, there was no right wing party to vote for until recently, until actually the um, 2019 elections, when this uh, party, the um, <clears throat> Alliance for the Unity of Romanians kind of rose to um, to the the scene and um, kind of entered the second or third party in the parliament. And I think a reason um, why we didn't have a far right populist party or um, why it wasn't ascending uh, or there was no discussion was because it was assumed, as uh, Marta also revealed, that the Romanian diaspora or the people that emigrate from Romania are usually highly skilled. And that was showing through their political participation in 2007. 17, 2018, there were protests organized mostly by the diaspora against the corruption um, of the government and all that. So the diaspora has always been associated with um, liberal parties, with liberal movements, with liberal uh, principles. But then what people didn't account for or that parties didn't account for was that a significant share of immigration from Romania is from low skilled individuals that work in agricultural sector, that work in an industry, that work in construction sectors all over Europe. And those people were those people that um, not only uh, they felt left behind and they felt that they are not taken into account in the political discourse. This is something rel relative to what Christoph said. In Romania, there is no political discourse about emigration. It's more like a laissez-faire um, because of its history of communism where emigration was not allowed or, and because uh, of um, a pro-European Union stance where free mobility is all right and all that, there is no public discourse on that. So uh, there individuals and particularly low skilled migrants, immigrants from Romania did not feel that their issues were addressed. And so they took to the to the urns, they took to voting, and which is why in many countries in in, uh, in 2019, in Italy, in Germany, there were um, the party even got first or second um, in those regions, kind of reflecting the changing patterns of emigration from Romania, but also the changing demands of these people that fell left behind. And I also want to emphasize that there is also a component of spatial inequality within Romania, that within the country as well, some regions that are also felt like left behind 
um, tended to vote for the far right party than um, than other regions that were more doing better from a socioeconomic perspective and um, indicators. So yeah, just wanted to kind of chip in on my own example and to say that uh, these developments might not be kind of um, reflected in the data uh, that Mike analyzed that goes up to 2018, but it's reflected in this uh, more recent. Um, yeah, and I think another component I just wanted to mention um, that helped with the voting patterns uh, was also the um, kind of the treatment of uh, low skilled migrants in uh, European countries um, during the pandemic and all that. And that kind of helped sediment the feelings of not being protected by the host countries, but also by the um, set by the origin countries as well. So as well. So um, who cares for us? So that's why they then kind of pushed this party in many regions. Thank you again for Thank you for the question. I can at least give part of an art answer to Christoph. Uh, first of all, it's nice to know that there are uh, people working uh, on uh, immigration, uh, and so there is space for cooperation also with uh, Magda, of course, uh, who I know is an expert on in this field. Um, our uh, focus was particularly on the political consequences of immigration, and this is related to our um, well, main focus at Medem. Uh, during the last year, we have been in our previous report, we have been looking at the political impact of immigration in European societies, looking especially at whether and to what extent the radical right parties profited, benefited from immigration in political terms, in electoral terms. So we wanted to revise the, uh, the perspective in our recent, in our last report and ask whether they do benefit also from immigration, um, which is, and we, what we found out is that the answer is more complex than we expected it to be. So it's not, in a way um, similar to the answer we gave to the question whether immigration has a political impact on the radical right parties, which is um, in, meanwhile quite obvious. Um, but what we also discovered, and maybe uh, Julia can add something, is that uh, with the exception of Bulgaria, um, uh, immigration is not uh, a key issue for uh, civil society actors. So there have not been so many uh, protesters uh, addressing this issue in most countries we have been analyzing, but perhaps uh, Bulgaria was an exception as in the, Bulgaria, in the report on Bulgaria, there were um, some, there were, um, protest uh, mentioned in this concern, but uh, otherwise uh, immigration is mainly um, a topic for media and not that much uh, for civil society actors. I don't know whether, Yulia, you want to add something on this. Yeah, maybe. So I think also our methodology, at least uh, when writing the different country chapters matters, because what we were looking for was debates in media. And then we tried to see the different actors that they part in these debates and also in parliament, right? So in parliament, clearly we had the politicians. At least in the Bulgarian case, uh, media revealed a lot of, as Olivero just mentioned, civil society participation. So there is a lot of, uh, and I think that's similar to Romania, actually, a lot of participation of um, protesters making an explicit point around emigration. Um, there were also NGOs that were um, engaged in policy responses, going back to your second question, Christoph, which was trying to bring back uh, people home, creating fairs for emigrants, uh, meeting them at the airport with bread and salt and all these kind of bizarre rituals. Uh, but again, this was mainly pointed towards the high-skilled emigration. Low-skilled emigration has completely remained under the radar of um, civil society both when it comes to protests and uh, when it comes to policy responses. One very interesting thing I noticed in the Bulgarian case, and I think we need to maybe um, see what the others have noticed in their country chapters, was Bulgarian um, business, like the, the Confederation of Industrialists, the, like big employers, were actually very much concerned about the immigration, and they insisted on importing uh, workers from third countries, uh, non-EU countries, and this has uh, created a very, very big debate in society between trade unions and employers in terms of, well, 
should employers just increase wages and not insist on importing cheap labor from abroad, etc. So this was, I would say, what was the, the discourse between trade unions and employers. There was much less um, instrumentalization of emigration by trade unions, uh, for example, to demand more rights and stuff like this. It was only in this debate where I could find it. So I guess, yeah. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to answer these questions? If not, I would. Um, uh, I have two further person in my uh, my list. Uh, the first one is Charlotte Wolfab from the Sachverständigenrat in Berlin and Marcin Erlinghausen from the University of Duisburg Essen. Charlotte, you're the next. Thank you. Um, I think you, you already have given some of the answers, but I would also be interested in policy responses. And as I understood the fact that uh, free movement and all this um, yeah, well, freedom of mobility is seen as a in general as a positive thing. There is not really a way of like restricting it or a discussion on restricting the free movement of immigrants, even if immigration as such is seen as a negative or as a negative thing for for the the countries of origin or for something that affects the um the economy. Is that right? Yes, you're nodding <laughs> partly. Um, but is there anything else that um that uh uh, national actors are trying to do to to restrict or to at least to um, lower the emigration of um, especially uh, high skilled um, people as this is seen as the most problematic. So are they doing anything about it or is it more a thing that is seen as, as, as negative but that cannot really be addressed politically? And a second question is, is you already mentioned that there is uh, maybe a, a relationship between emigration on the one hand and immigration on the other, even if this is not seen or if this relationship is not made officially very often. But is there evidence of replacement of emigrated uh, personnel by immigrants? You mentioned the case of Czech Republic, where um, healthcare workers from Ukraine uh, replace uh, Czech healthcare workers that have moved to uh, Germany or other places in, in Europe. Is this also something that can be seen in other countries that you um, examined? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcel Erlinghausen. Uh, Erlinghagen, sorry. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I work on emigration from Germany and remigration to Germany, especially um, from German citizens. And therefore, I was very interested to see how immigration has developed in, in other countries. And uh, I think it was very interesting to see that uh, obviously emigration has increased uh, in, in, in a lot of countries in Southern Europe or in Eastern Europe. And uh, I have to confess that I'm not really sure um, about um, how Eurostat um, calculates um, or identifies uh, emigrants. Uh, are these numbers for um, cases? or for individuals. And that turns to my, to, to my point, we have to consider circular migration. So how long will people stay abroad or do they move several times a year abroad and come back and forth and back and forth? And uh, this question, how long people stay abroad could be also have an impact on the political response so uh, maybe if you have a lot of, of circular migration, it does not really matter because, uh, well, my, my, my friends come back every year uh, or the neighbors come back every year or do they, um, uh, will, will they leave the country forever? So um, this is, think, I think, a very interesting point um, we have to keep in mind if we talk about emigration and re-migration and its its um, its its uh, impacts, and um, I think we we need that it's not your fault. Uh, um, better data on life courses of uh, immigrants and re-migrants, and not uh, aggregated data. Um, and unfortunately, this is uh, um, often the only database we have. Um, so the question is. Um, if you have any information, how is it with Eurostat? Uh, is it um, cases or is it individuals? 
just one individual, e even if uh, they move uh, several times a year. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. I guess Marta wants to answer to some of them at least. Uh, yes, exactly. I'm like, I think I can answer the last question completely and the first two somewhat. Oh, kind of a contribute to the answer. Uh, when it comes to Eurostat, um, actually, the way it is measured is very conservative. So the definition is basically it's individuals who live outside of a home country for at least a year, which means the circular migration, the shorter migration of three months, six months is not even counted there. So this is a very conservative estimates of people who actually left and they did so uh, a year before or longer. So we do not even include the, um, the messy part of the emigration. This is actually uh, a much bigger issue when it comes to migration research in, in general is basically how do you define migration? How do you measure it? Because the measurements of uh, emigration is notoriously bad because for example, in Eurostat, you only have people who live for a year and actually um, register themselves as having left. And how about the people who are actually, you know, one leg here, one leg there, or that they are circular? So we have a lot of this kind of a messy part uh, of immigration, both E and M immigration, that is actually not really covered. And there, the question is there even a good way to actually cover it in quantitative matters? so that we can have good data that we can work with. So um, yes, it's a big problem, problem that in general, there is no good data on immigration in either direction. And the issue itself is actually quite a complex and multidimensional uh, problem. And actually it will cost a lot of money and a lot of resources to actually have um, somewhat comprehensive data set. So of course, this is also another problem uh, when you do research like the ones we did, when we do a lot of compar comparative things, but then some countries have some national data that is quite good, but it's only in this country because other countries have different methodologies or they do not ask this question in, um, in polls or, or statistical uh, kind of official statistics. They simply don't do it. And then um, how do you do comparative studies if you don't have data that can be compared? So um, it's a general problem that uh, there is no way around it without a lot of resources. So maybe by you know rising attention, giving attention to the topic, we can actually uh, make the, the issue kind of a more visible. And as I say, we need money, we need good data, we need good, good resources to actually uh, give you good answers of uh, how to answer this, these issues politically. So uh, I hope this answers your questions when it comes to the first two questions, um, immigration and emigration. Uh, one thing is, does it replace it? And second, how is it kind of a connected in the discourse? And the second one is no, actually people perceive both issues as important, but as separate issues. So it's not like connected issues. The more people leave, the more people come. So we should stop people from coming so that immigrants don't come. It's not like that. A little bit in Hungary, uh, but otherwise, it's, it's seen as completely separated issues that are somehow um, connected in the sense, of course, there are more places or workplaces for immigrants if our natives leave, uh, but it's not like the immigrants wouldn't come if the nations wouldn't leave, it's just more places will be created. Um, when it comes to the replacement, it is much easier to do when it comes to low skill migration and it actually happens. It's much harder to do when it comes to high skill migration, which might explain also why the focus is so high on that because uh, so one thing is actually uh, to have someone move who is, who is a construction worker, okay, there is some vocabulary that you have to um, learn, but basically the learning curve is relative low. You simply have to learn what the things that you're using are called in this different language. But if you want to, to have a teacher or if you want to have a um, university um, researcher or a, a doctor or a physician, then it, it demands much higher demand of, of language and uh, much more kind of a cultural um, 
integration beforehand. And there is also another issue that it's maybe not that visible is um, basically uh, the high skill migrants who are living um, Central Eastern Europe or Southern Europe going are going mostly to another EU country, which means the uh, nostrification or the recognition of the credentials are much easier within the EU because of the Bologna process. If you want to take a physician from India or from Ukraine, they come from outside of the EU, which means the recognition of the credentials of the diplomas of the diplomas will be much more complicated and much more expensive. So it's not like it's as easy for Poland or for Greece to, uh, you know, to draw physicians from another country that are even lower on the economic scale uh, than the given country. So it is problematic and it's, it's not one-to-one. -one. And of course, um, this is something that we, um, we have to remember. So basically the mitigation uh, of Ukrainians and Slovakians and so on coming to, the, to these countries actually cause the same problems in their own countries. So we have now a huge emigration problem in Ukraine. Of course, it mitigates the problem in, in Czechia or in Poland, but it creates the same problem in Ukraine. So we are just kind of uh, pushing the problem to another country. So we have you know, a spill-off effect. Um, and at one time you will simply, uh, you know, the, the list of, of countries that are below you that you might attract uh, will, be, will be exhausted. So um, it's a pyramid scheme in a way. Thank you, Marta, Mariana. Um, yeah, I can say a few things about Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So in regards to this uh, last one on, um, on Eurostat data, this is indeed a, a huge issue, as Marta said. What I've noticed when um, writing reports on Spain and Portugal is, is that different countries have different methodologies. And so Eurostat usually just brings in the data of statistical offices in each country, right? Uh, but actually these countries, they'd have different ways of counting immigrants. And I saw that in the case of Portugal and Spain, they, they count immigrants in completely different ways. Portugal does it through surveys. Uh, in Spain, actually, they just count the number of uh, Spanish or other uh, citizens who lived in Spain who then register in consulates abroad. So what you actually see, and there was a survey of the immigrant population in Southern Europe, and it asked them if they actually bothered to register or deregister. And there was a huge percentage, in some cases, more than 50% who didn't bother to do this. So they are not even counted. Uh, in the numbers. So that's definitely uh, an issue, a problem um, that's, well, I don't really know how to, how to address. Um, uh, that being said, there are, there are, for instance, in Portugal, there are other uh, sources of data. So I also try to, to compare to other sources of data and get uh, a more fair picture from there. But of course, it's, um, it's always a bit of a black box. Um, now, uh, when it comes to the replacement issue, um, well, I, I don't have a good answer for the question of whether there is direct replacement or not. What I see in Southern Europe is that uh, the general discourse, and you're all familiar with that, is that um, many of the migrants who come here are coming to do the jobs that the natives do not want to do. So in this sense, even just in perceptional terms, there is no perception that they are coming to replace the natives because they are simply coming to do jobs that the natives do not want to do. That's the general perception. Now, in regards to policy responses, this was an issue saved, uh, raised by several people. There are indeed some policy efforts being taken. Of course, uh, since we live in the EU and since uh, these countries are all uh, democracies who cannot just restrict uh, explicitly the freedom of movement of their citizens, you can only come up with certain incentives to try to steer immigration numbers. And so there are some countries who have implemented so-called return programs, programs directed at encouraging the return of migrants by providing certain incentives 
for example, fiscal incentives, giving them fiscal benefits when coming back to the country. Portugal has such a program. So I think that um, basically it, it they propose to reduce the fiscal burden by around 50%. And they also give uh, a little bit of a monetary incentive uh, to those who return. Um, but of course, the, first of all, it's difficult to assess the impact of these kind of programs. Second of all, yes, there are some people who have recurred to these programs, but you always wonder, would they return anyway or not? <laughs> and um, third of all, I mean, the, the difference in, um, in socioeconomic terms between uh, Portugal and other EU countries is still so big that I don't think the incentives provided by this kind of uh, programs really um, fill the gap in, in this case. So I think in the end, this, this kind of programs have a very limited impact or I expect them to have a limited impact. Uh, but yes, there are some, some policy responses that, uh, that have been taken. Uh, Spain also has a, a sort of return program, um, less, I think, even less, um, with less incentives than the Portuguese one, and I think Greece has one too. Um, I don't know if other authors want to add on this. Um, other points that have been raised. Uh, indeed, there, there's a lot of avenues for future research that have been highlighted here. One of them um, that several of you highlighted is the link between, um, between emigration or emigrants' profile and their political preferences. Are they significantly different from the ones uh, who stay? We do, we do not look at this, but this is indeed, uh, I think, a super interesting avenue for, uh, for future research not only in terms of political preferences, but also in terms of, um, I think it would be interesting to look at whether immigrants are more like in favor of uh, an open society mentality, while those who stayed will have a more closed society outlook. Um, I don't know if there are any studies being done on this already, but it would certainly be very interesting. Uh, further questions, I see Anna. I actually just wanted to add a little bit to the policy discussion. So, mm -hmm. uh, if I may, so this is a perfect link, actually. Please, yes. Okay, good. So, yeah, I wrote uh, Hungary and Greece. Um, so, my perspective is from these two countries, and I think Mariana said it very well. I want to add a couple of points. The first one is that there are targeted immigration policies, but then a little bit like all policy is immigration policy, right? So labor market policy, um, education, higher education policy, housing. In Hungary, there are parties that are asking, you know, for better housing for, for the young so they don't leave and so on and so forth. So this is also a little bit, a little bit difficult to tackle exactly because of this. Um, and, uh, and then um, in, uh, I think the most extreme kind of policy was uh, in Greece, uh, sorry, in Hungary, always, um, always uh, a step ahead, uh, where they had uh, this uh, policy of, um, of uh, students being obliged to sign so-called student contracts um, that in order to get um, um, publicly financed education, then they would need um, they would be obliged to spend some uh, years in the country. So this was one of the quite extreme uh, policies. And then as Mariana says, these return uh, policies, they are more symbolic. Um, so in order for the governments to be able to say something, but actually many of them fail, many of them uh, attract a few dozen or a few hundred people, and also very, very selective again. So examples from Greece, rebrain Greece. This was the label of the policy. In Italy, uh, I think it's rientro di cervelli. So there is always this emphasis really on the high skilled, the young, the kind of valuable uh, members of, uh, of society, and much less so on, um, on low skilled workers who we know are actually uh, quite a big part of this, uh, of this phenomenon too. That's, that's it from my part.
Thank you, Anna. Um, Magda, do you want to follow up on this or? Is... I, I just wanted to provide an example uh, from yeah. the case of Romania to answer Charlotte's questions, but I think uh, Julia raised her hand first, so I can go after. No, no, go first, don't worry, because I oh. think you're going to, yeah. Oh, I'll go. thank you. I just wanted um, to answer um, uh, from my experience with the case of Romania on the role uh, or the and or the responses of the part, uh, government to immigration. As, as I was saying, Romania doesn't uh, have um, a formal immigration policy. What they do is kind of create, have cultural events or try to connect culturally with the diaspora in other countries, which has prompted, and this is something that has not been studied much um, in the research, has prompted local governments to start taking initiatives and to start doing something to tackle the effects of immigration. So from my own research in Romania, there are villages where the mayor and the local government is actually actively pursuing uh, measures to re-incentivize immigration, but also to incentivize investments into the village or into the town. So this has, uh, these developments are in the absence of a national immigration framework. So they feel kind of compelled to take measures or to do something because there is no uh, because the government is not doing something for various reasons. And I think uh, Marcel was um, pointing to something that is relevant in this case also, is immigration permanent or is immigration circular? And in the case of Romania, more and more immigration is circular. And so the government contributes from remittances, contributes from the exchange of, um, of skills, contributes from this kind of circularity that is beneficial to the country as well. That means that, um, again, with the reasons that I mentioned earlier, they're not as inclined to do something about that. Um, so what I wanted to point to the fact is that even in countries where there is no strategy on immigration, there is nothing done yet because there is no public political discourse on it, local governments are taking measures to deal with it. And then I wanted to talk about uh, replacing immigration and immigration in Romania. Again, uh, someone mentioned that in Bulgaria, for instance, there is this kind of discussion with the trade unions. And, um, and this is not the case in Romania, but there has been some pressure from employers who cannot find, um, there are cases in cities in um, bakeries or factories, and they cannot find individuals to work for because of of course, the, they prefer working abroad for the same jobs, the same skills, but much higher health, salaries. So there has been a push from employers to increase the cap uh, to allow um, third country immigrants into the country. So this has not been in the media, there has not been a political debate or public debate, but the country has slowly for the past few years increased the cap for third country nationals to enter. So we, we have immigration from Nepal, we have immigration from, there is immigration from China, so on and so forth. So people that are brought specifically for specific jobs, it has not been a discussion. There hasn't been uh, the trade unions. I, I haven't seen anything uh, to, to look into that. There is no push to increase salaries so that people return, but slowly the government is kind of, uh, yeah, somewhat stealthily increasing this and dealing with the, the ensuing um, labor shortages in the country by, by yeah, increasing the caps and attracting more people and, uh, increase, and uh, having bilateral agreements with various countries. So, and, and the one more point I wanted to mention on the um, source of data and how it's, for instance, in Romania, immigrants are uh, registered as those, as, are considered those who have deregistered from the municipality. And because immigration is so circular in Romania, and even if those that have permanently migrated and still come in holidays and all that do not deregister. So the, the actual immigration rate from the official statistics in Romania, it's grossly underestimated. So again, pointing to the difficulty of, of uh, dealing with data on migration in general. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Yula, do you still have an yeah. eyes? Yeah, very quick. Please. I don't know how yeah. much time we have, but yeah, I must, uh, to emphasize Magda's point, I actually have lived abroad since 10 years, but I still have my official address in Sofia. So I've never registered in any country in which I've lived or like, I've always kept also my original address. But I just wanted Could to- I yeah, I just wanted to very briefly say that I, I find this uh, conversation super interesting. Uh, and I think at least 
four maybe research agendas emerged for me out of the discussion so far. So first, based on the responses of Mike and like the, I, I didn't know how very like how different the Eastern German cases. But I think on based on what Mike and Magda actually said, it might be very interesting to do comparative research on the influence of emigration on voting, considering the profile of diasporas, what uh, Mariana just mentioned. So I think this is one very, very fruitful avenue for future research. Then um, something that Magda mentioned, the role of local governments, I think this is very, very interesting. And, and what Anna mentioned about the fact that every policy is basically immigration policy, so policies on housing, etc. I think this is another very under-researched uh, um, field. Then third, something that I thought about while we were discussing is the, the issue of cultural narratives around emigration. Um, is there pressure by society for people to emigrate? How are people who are not emigrating perceived, etc.? This is such a prominent topic in popular culture, at least in Bulgaria. So this is a more cultural studies, let's say, perspective. And finally, going back to Marcel's point about emigration and circular migration, I, yeah, I absolutely agree that we are missing a huge, sorry, there is a thing, a huge um, aspect of migration that's going on. But I would also urge for making a conceptual distinction between emigration and circular migration for two main reasons. Um, sorry, horrible noises behind me. But uh, first of all, I would say that um, research has shown, for example, in the UK, sorry, I'm going inside. Um, research has shown in the UK uh, that, for example, UK voters consider seasonal migration much less problematic in comparison to emigration. Uh, there was a fascinating presentation by uh, Roxana, and let me just check the name so that I don't uh, misspell it. I think Roxana, uh, Roxana Barbescu on um, perceptions of migration in the UK. And she showed very clearly that circular migration is actually fine because as uh, Mariana mentioned, people who go there, they don't take the jobs of anyone. Uh, they just take jobs that are not wanted at all. But also in a uh, project that we have started with Manes Weiskerher, who is also here, um, we are looking at truck drivers and the politicization of the posted workers directive. And it's very interesting that these truck drivers protested against regulations that would benefit them because it was considered that um, basically if Bulgarian truck companies um, go bankrupt, they will have to emigrate persistently. So they preferred going as posted workers abroad than emigrating um, altogether. And I think this shows that in terms of perception of uh, both uh, the population in host countries and in terms of the perception of migrant workers themselves, there is a difference between circular migration or posted work and emigration as a life choice. So I think this conceptual distinction is also something that we can work more on. And I apologize for uh, all the noises behind me. No problem, Julia. Um, since we only have 15 minutes left, I want to ask Cecilia Brusilius to ask uh, to, to ask her a question or give a comment if if she wish, and ask everyone to give very short answers. Please, Cecilia. Uh, thank you. Sorry for coming in so late, but uh, I was just listening to what everyone was saying. It's a great, great discussion. Thank you. Uh, first, just uh, this wasn't my question, but what Julia was talking about, I thought of it's interesting with this whole discussion of narrative um, on the historical experiences of migration, which we know from all migration research matters, right? And I'm thinking then of sort of Italy compared to, for example, as a immigration country compared to the others. But um, actually, I wanted to ask something that I think is, um, well, it's directed to everyone, but first I'll ask it specifically to Magda on Romania, because from what I understand, uh, there has been, I, I read about it, that there has been a lowering of uh, actually social security contribution as a way of keeping, so wages are actually increasing, uh, but as a way to keep the low wage uh, competition strategy, which is one that we see across Eastern Europe, what has happened? Will you lower the uh, social security contribution to make labor cheaper? So I was wondering if this is something that's within the country in dealing with labor uh, shortages, right? But also to keep a certain political economy in place. Um, and I was wondering if this is something, if that's correct, or if it's something that I got wrong, or and if it's happening elsewhere as well, from what you uh, country experts know. I'd be really interested in that. Thanks. Magda, you want? Yes. Sorry. Please, please go on. 
Um, on the case of Romania, I did not know of uh, the lowering of social security contributions. Um, so uh, that is something new for me too. I just wrote it down and I'm going to investigate, but that might be a way for the country to deal with, um, um, yeah, with uh, keeping salaries uh, competitive or, yeah, and uh, trying to uh, attract people or at least uh, deter them from, from leaving. I will have to investigate that because I'm not sure um, exactly what, uh, yeah. But thank you for pointing it out to me. Uh, just a quick point. It happens with Bulgarian truck drivers. So their major complaint is that they are, have social security on the sum of 250, 300 euro, and then they get all the rest of their salary informally uh, in order to get a normal salary. Thank you very much, Julia, also for your uh, useful list of open questions, open issues on the field of immigration. I was wondering, I mean, one of the issues we have been dealing with in, uh, in our report was indeed the, the cultural um, narrative about immigration. And what I found, and this is maybe a question for everyone, um, what I found surprising is um, how differently uh, immigration on the one hand and diaspora are seen. So immigration is seen mostly as a socioeconomic problem in uh, both Southern European countries, but also in Central and Eastern European countries. So that's something which is problematic um, and dramatically problematic for some countries, while diaspora are mostly seen in a positive way um, as uh, ambassador of, of culture abroad, as, uh, well, uh, partners in uh, economic cooperation. Um, so how comes there is this very strong difference in seeing immigration on the one hand and uh, um, em immigrants community ad abroad? I mean, if I can just react yes, to yes, uh, yes. So I, I thought uh, this was very interesting. And I think you pointed uh, this especially for the Greek uh, report, because there you have a, a very interesting situation. The Greek diaspora is one of the kind of arch archetypes of diasporas. Um, and as a Greek, of course, I always start with uh, etymological uh, discussions. But um, in any case, it's really something that has been very strongly there. And um, nonetheless, the expa uh, expatriate vote uh, was only given in 2019. So until then, people actually could not vote uh, outside of the country. They had to always uh, um, come back to Greece. And if you look uh, into this uh, parliamentary debate, one of, the, one of the questions there was how to, to draw the line between this kind of traditional diaspora and uh, the more recent emigration, uh, the more recent emigrants. And there is this perception that the moral claims of more recent emigrants are much, much um, more stronger, um, both because their ties to the country are much more recent. As Julia says, many of them, they don't even register abroad, right? They, they come and go um, uh, to Greece. Uh, but also because it, there is a perception that they were kind of pushed away, that they didn't go because they wanted to, but because they had to. And so this is really as a kind of compensation. While for historic diasporas, it's something that is in the past, that there are some cultural policies with which it, it's nice you know, to, to have these links um, language, um, to do the traditional dances. So it's all in the realm of culture. But for, uh, for recent immigrants, it's really in the realm of, of socioeconomics and, and something that, you know, th they are seen as bearing the burden of, um, of a situation that they are not responsible for. Thank you, Anna. Marta? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add something. Um, which may be a little bit specific to Poland, but I think um, in a couple of years or decades, we can see a similar problem for other countries because um, the Polish case is also specific in this case that we do not only have the migration of the last 10 years, which is like the big one, the, the post-accession one, 
but Poland has a uh, history of migration since 19th century. And um, actually in the 80s, it was also over a million people in the 60s, half a million people and so on. So basically what, what it also means is that um, um, there are migrants of every generation um, from Poland. And when it comes to this kind of a um, diaspora, which is called Polonia traditionally, and the Polish migrants of the recent years, there is a huge, I don't know if it's a generational gap, but there is kind of a mentality gap. Um, like I used to live in Berlin uh, before I moved to Dresden for a couple of years. And actually, I was quite active in this kind of a migrant Polish, Polonia, something um, milieus. And there was like a huge gap between the traditional Polonia cultural organizations and uh, kind of a more, I don't want to say modern, but kind of a younger. It was These were people like 30 plus and uh, the Polonia people were like 50 plus. And these people just wanted to have, you know, summer fest with some uh, Polish uh, pop stars and something like that. And the idea to kind of open up to the younger people was to have dance parties with Polish music. And the, the young Polish people were like, we have Spotify. So the, there's, there is some kind of a generational difference. And um, the, the, it's also kind of, I don't want to say this is kind of an identity difference, but it is more like that younger people or younger migration, like maybe people over 50, but migrated in the last five or 10 years, tend not to see themselves as Polonia, but tend to see themselves as migrants. And it's like, especially if you live in, in Germany and you want to go to Poland, it's just going for a weekend to Poland is like that. Like I have some time, I have some money, I can go for a weekend to Poland and I don't even like if I want to read a book in Poland, I can just download an ebook. So um, the need for kind of a Polonia diaspora organizations is less and less. And I think that, that it will also be a problem for um, for the countries that actually have to have want to have connections with the Polonia and treat them as ambassadors and kind of a, uh, the connection with the, the culture and so on is what kind of culture do we want to kind of, uh, you know, have uh, kids dancing traditional dances also in, in, in Dublin? Or do we want something else? Do we want to have um, an open cultural exchange with these people? Do we want to actually deliver Polish culture or Romanian culture or whatever to the people abroad? Or do we want to treat them as uh, people who actually create culture as well? So I think this is also something that I don't think in any of the countries is actually a discussion about what does it mean to have contact with diaspora, what does it mean to take care of the diaspora, and I think this this might become a big problem in the future, and nobody is talking about it. Well, I think that when it comes to the different political treatment of my of the diaspora and the immigration at the exit of people, it's it's actually quite logical from a political point of view at the end because the diaspora are migrants who have settled abroad and whom you are not expecting to return to the country. So better take advantage of them as, as they are. They are already seen as, uh, as people who, who have left. While the, the recent wave of immigration, it's still very much up in the air whether people will return or not. Um, so I think that in the end, uh, the, the, the political treatment, the different political treatment is quite um, normal. Maybe just a quick jump in to ask Anna something, because uh, I remember in the reports by Anna and um, Anna Alexandra, actually the question of racialization was also very important. So I think we can treat the diaspora, at least when we talk about Bulgaria and Romania as a uniform um, entity because there is a very strong racialized discourse in which whatever whenever there is a crime committed abroad it's necessarily the Roma uh, and this was very strong during the COVID as well so maybe if, uh, Anna can say a bit about this. No this doesn't really apply to my cases actually. So maybe it was yeah I think you then yeah, told me about was, the report it, of Anna Alexandra. It, yeah. it came up in the Romanian report and I think that's a super interesting aspect yeah. Yeah, because at least in the Bulgarian case, we can't talk about a uniform diaspora because the imagined mm -hmm. diaspora is the liberal right that very progressive. The real diaspora is cross-sectional and yes. no one ever talks about the, the Roma immigrants, mm -hmm. Bulgarian Roma immigrants as part mm -hmm. of the diaspora at all. They're mm -hmm. just completely invisible uh, mm -hmm. unless when it comes to like yeah, 
accusing them of criminality, for example. And I think this is very, very interesting and very troubling because they were among the first to emigrate. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I guess read the Romanian report for more detail because in my, this is only very, very sketchily mentioned, but I think Anna Alexandra has actually analyzed this in depth. Yeah. Just a just a quick comment on the case of, of Germany and in, in, in Eastern Germany, there is no narrative on the, the problems and consequences of this out migration have not been addressed or debate un, debated until recently when the AFD party got, got stronger and stronger in the aftermath of the refugee crisis since 2014. And in recent years, there are actually also a couple of initiatives of young uh, Eastern Germans who moved away to interconnect each other. Because since this time, since 2014, they are uh, they, they uh, found themselves uh, asked questions in, in, in the countries where they are. Why are your relatives in Eastern Germany so xenophobic, for instance? And so there is a kind of Eastern German diaspora forming, you could you could say. But in a general sense, I would say that this out migration has never been debated, and there are there's no narrative. But there is are it seems to have indirect social psychological consequences, because these regions, as you know, not only in Eastern Germany but also, for instance, in Bavaria and other regions, they they turn to be particularly prone to anti anti-immigration resentments to, to perceptions of threat, of fear of decline, worries about the future and so on. F uh, feelings which are successfully addressed by populist actors and by the AFD. But this is a field where much more work is to do on that, uh, which we will continue, of course, for instance, uh, in a paper which Kyrill Oteni and me are preparing uh, uh, these days. So much more work to do. Thank you, Mike. This is a good reminder for me also to mention that Kirill Otten is one of the co-authors of the uh, report. Um, and he also wrote a uh, chapter together with Mike. And Alexandra Anna, who was mentioned by Julia, is the author of the chapter on um, on Romania in uh, in the in the report, and who was uh, addressing the issue of uh, racialized perspectives on immigrants, especially focusing on the Roma in Italy. They were this uh, they were um, they were not seen as Romanian in the me Romanian media. Media. I don't know whether uh, Magda agree agrees with this point, but this was one of the key messages from her media analysis. Uh, 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 around uh, Roma immigration in Europe. So if there are no further questions or comments of last chance now, I, uh, I wish to thank all participants, especially the speakers, of course. I, it was a, a very inspiring uh, meeting. And uh, indeed, as it has been mentioned uh, by many speakers, I think uh, immigration is still a, an understudied uh, field of migration uh, research. So um, there is still hope that we might in future cooperate and keep, uh, keep in touch uh, to work on different issues uh, of immigration. Uh, um, and uh, and it, it is great that you have been part of this first meeting uh, uh, today. Um, again, thanks to all authors of the um, report and to those who contributed um, to organize it. Thank you to everyone and see you hopefully soon. Thank you.